So today, our goal is to understand and apply the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem for continuous functions is defined as follows. A function, y equals f of x, that is continuous on the closed interval a to b takes on every value between f of a and f of b. In other words, if y0 is between f of a and f of b, then y0 must equal f of c for some c in the closed interval a to b. Now that's really mathy. Let's try and uh, make it a little bit easier for us to understand in terms of an example. So here's an example of uh, when the intermediate value theorem works and when it doesn't. So if we have a closed interval A to B, that means that we're looking at every single X value from A to B. So if we look at the X values from A to B in our example, what happens is every single value of y between f of a and f of b must get hit by the function somewhere. So if we're looking at this and I trace it out, if I look at every value of y between f of a and f of b, it gets hit by the function. So if I look at the function, every single value between those two red dotted lines gets hit. That doesn't mean that there aren't values that get hit that aren't between f of a and f of b. So it's very possible that within a function, for example, in this function, we have other values between a and b on the x axis that hit y values that are not between our two dotted lines. For example, all of these values are not between f of a and f of b. They still get hit. Uh, if we have an example like a linear function, so I'm just going to draw a linear function real quick. If we have a linear function that starts here and ends here, there are no values outside of our dotted uh, lines that get hit. I can have plenty of other functions. I can have a polynomial function. Nothing outside the dotted lines gets hit. But there are some times when there are values where it gets hit outside of our dotted lines. Um, so what, we're, what the intermediate value theorem does not say is that all values must be between f of a and f of b. What it does say is if we have a continuous function, then if we know what f of a and f of b are, there must be some value of the function that hits everything along the way between f of a and f of b. So for example, if I said c was equal to um, this y value, there must be at least one point on the function where that y value is hit. Now when we look at the counterexample, that's not continuous. So if I know where f of a and f of b are, or if I know where a and b are, um, there are some values between a and b such that f of a and f of b are like it doesn't hit everything. So clearly, there's a huge gap in the y values there. So this does not hold unless it's continuous. So if we go back to our definition, a function y equals f of x that is continuous on a closed interval a to b takes on every value between a and b. So if I, for example, let's say I have y equals x squared. And I'm looking at the interval from 1 to 3. So if x is in 1 to 3, then what I know is y is 
the y values where this works. Uh, so one, one, three, nine. If I kind of look at that graph from one to three, uh, all the values between one and nine have to be hit on that function. So uh, if I look at some value, let's say uh, the value is five. That's between one and nine. So in that case, there must be some value C such that F of C equals five. And we can solve for it pretty easily. So uh, F of C is equal to C squared. And we know that F of C must equal five at some point. So C equals plus or minus the square root of five. Well, negative square root of five isn't in the interval that we're talking about, but positive square root of five is. So that means at positive square root of five, which would be somewhere around here uh, on the X values, we hit the Y value five. Okay, now let's go into uh, your examples on your worksheet. Use the intermediate value theorem to verify that there is a zero on the stated interval. So, uh, in order to verify that there's a zero, what that means is that between zero and two for the x's, so x is between zero and two, one of them must be positive and one of them must be negative, and the function must be continuous. First, let's look at the function. It is a polynomial function. All polynomial functions are continuous. Okay, check. So now let's move on to uh, actually verifying that this works. So if we take a look at f of 0, that's negative 2. We substitute in 2 to the function, we get f of 2 equals 14. So because between 0 and 2, uh, our f, our function values, have to, since it's continuous, hit every single y value between negative 2 and 14, there is some value where f of c, some value c, must equal 0. And you could solve for it if you knew how to solve quintics, um, but since most of you don't know the quintic function, and actually I don't even know the quintic function because it's really, really, really hard, uh, you would probably have to use your calculator in order to figure out what that value of c is. But it's not asking us for the value of c, it's just asking us to verify there's a zero. Now let's look at the second question. That's also a continuous function um, on the interval 2 to 4. So if we take a look at substituting 2 and 4 in, we find out that the value is one for both of them. Um, okay, so what does that mean? That means that between two and four, there has to be some value that hits one, and it can include two and four. Um, so we already know two values where it hits one, when x equals two and x equals four. So this doesn't actually tell us anything. In this case, the intermediate value theorem gives us no information. Uh, we cannot actually tell if there's a zero due to the intermediate value theorem. Is there a zero? Well, we can check by solving the function. So we can clearly get x equals 3 to be a zero. So when x equals 3, there's a 0. But the intermediate value theorem doesn't actually tell you that because if we look at the interval from 2 to 4, all the intermediate value theorem says is every value between 1 and 1 must be hit. And that's really not very many values. Again, like we talked about in the examples, it's possible that even though the intermediate value theorem holds, there are values outside of that range that get hit. But that's not actually telling us anything by the intermediate value theorem. OK, next couple questions on your notes. Use the intermediate value theorem to find an interval of length 1 for which there is a solution to x cubed minus x plus 1 equals 0. Um, 
well, this is kind of the answer, but uh, let's figure out why that is. So if we look at the graph of x cubed minus x plus 1, if we look at the graph of x cubed minus x plus 1, uh, we want that to equal 0 somewhere. Okay, so if we look at the graph, we are looking at it and we say, oh, there's a 0 here. That's between negative 2 and negative 1. So because it's between negative 2 and negative 1, what we can do is we can substitute in negative 1 to the function. And if I substitute negative 1 into the function, I get 1. If I substitute negative 2 into the function, that's actually off our screen, but I would get negative 5. Because that's the case, every single value on the interval negative 2 to negative 1, or on the interval negative 2 to negative 1, sorry, I misspoke, so let's try that again. On the interval of x between negative 2 and negative 1, every y value between negative 5 and 1 must have some value that works. So there is some f of c, there's some c, such that f of c equals 0 between negative 2 and negative 1. We could solve for it if we knew the cubic equation, but since we don't know that, you would probably have to use a calculator and uh, in order to actually figure it out. Finally, let's do a few uh, true-false statements. Uh, what I want you to do is take a few minutes, um, pause the video, and then we will come back and go through these together. But I kind of want you to uh, try these on your own. So I'm going to pause for five seconds. You try these uh, by pausing it. And then I'll come back and go over all the answers. OK, if g of x is a function with g of 0 equals 4 and g of 3 equals 7, then there's some x between 0 and 3 such that g of x equals 5. So if we look at the function, um, g of 0 is 4, g of 3 is 7. That means that some value between 0 and 3, there has to be a value g of x where uh, there has to be some g of c where that equals 5, right? Actually, not correct. What is missing from this piece of information, or what's missing from this sentence, is something telling you that g of x is continuous. Since it doesn't say... that it is continuous. We can't assume that it's continuous, and therefore we must call this false. Is there a value between 0 and 3 such that g of x equals 5? There could be, but we do not have enough information in order to actually tell. Statement 2, let f of x be this function. Well, since this is a polynomial function, it is continuous. Is there a point between 1 and 2 where f of x equals 4? Well, f of 1 is equal to negative 3, and f of 2 is equal to 8 plus 8 minus 5, so that's 11. That means that since this is continuous, on the closed interval for x, 1 to 2, there must be every single y value hit between negative 3 and 11. So the intermediate value theorem says that this statement must be true. Statement 3, if f of t is continuous on the closed interval negative 5 to 3, Okay, it tells us it's continuous, so that's good. Uh, if f of five equals, or f of negative five equals six, and f of three equals negative nine, then f of zero could be equal to ten. That is true, but not due to the intermediate value theorem. So again, uh, if we have a picture where f of negative five is six, and f of three is negative nine, so that's somewhere down there, um, it doesn't have to be true. Um, but all the question is asking for is saying that f of 0 could be equal to 10. So is it possible that our graph looks like this and f of 0 is not 10? Very possibly. Everything between um, negative 9 and 6 for the y values must be hit. But that doesn't mean that everything has to be hit. So we could have a graph that looks like this. And this could be 10. 
Uh, finally, a function f of t depicts the quantity of flimflam present at time t. At t equals zero, there were 10 cubic cans of flimflam, and a week later, there were 40 cubic cans of flimflam. At no time were there exactly 20 cubic cans of flimflam present. Therefore, the function f of t is not continuous. That's true by the definition of the intermediate value theorem, because if uh, there's stuff between 10 and 40 um, from time t equals zero to time t equals seven days or how, whatever they're doing in terms of t, then there must be something that has 20 cubic hands if there is a continuous function. And that's our lesson on the intermediate value theorem.